Hey everyone, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. Happy Friday, everybody. Today we are going to take a look at your sun and rising sign horoscopes for the month of December. And today I am joined by my friend and colleague, Alex Amorosi, who's going to help me do that. You guys know Alex, he's with me every month, helping break down the horoscopes of the month. It's always a joy to have him on. I'll tell you more about him and his work at the end of the show if you want to connect with him. Uh, but that's what we're going to be doing for today. We have several transits that we're going to be looking at for the month for all 12 signs. We hope you enjoy these and that these will give you some good things to think about. As always, before we get into it, don't forget to like and subscribe. Share your comments and reflections, what you're thinking about or what's on your mind with respect to these horoscopes as we unpack them today. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can always find a transcript of any of these daily talks on the website, nightlightastrology.com. As you guys know, we are inching closer to our goal of raising the support of 1,777 backers by New Year's Eve. We have, uh, it's the 1st of December, we have a whole month to go until New Year's Eve, and we are right on our way. Uh, so far, as of the time I'm recording this intro, we have 231 backers out of the 1,777 that we need. So that means we still need 1,546 backers, people out there like yourself to say, hey, I really like this show. I like the things you guys do. I want to support you and your team in the production of this content in the year ahead. And you know that there are a lot of good things that come along with that. We are building a donation-based reading clinic to offer affordable reading services. The funds that we raise uh, this year will help. That's one of our stretch goals. That's going to help us get there. Uh, you're supporting my staff. Of course, this is part of how I earn my living. So we really deeply appreciate your support. And today I want to tell you about three things that I try to avoid in the content I create. Uh, I like to keep things positive, so I don't mean to be talking smack, but there are three things that I really try to avoid in the way that I create content, and I think it's valuable for all of you to consider these things because I think it's what separates my channel or channels like mine from other astrological news sources out there, let's say. And that, I think, uh, is something I, something I want to share so that you know that what you're supporting comes from a space that, uh, that where the you can understand more about the intentions that go into the creation of our daily content. So these are three things that I try to avoid in the way that I create your content for you five days a week. Number one is celestial gossip. It is very important to me that this not be a place that people come and feel like the tone or mood is one of some kind of gossip column. And no offense to people who like gossip columns, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to judge anyone, but what I, the kind of astrology that I do I don't personally like, and I really want this channel to be um, different in this respect is I don't like it when you tune into astrology and it's like, there's no way in which this is pointing us toward a larger spiritual reality, or it's helping us to stay in alignment with our experiences. It's helping us to grow as people. It's helping us to reflect with some depth and uh, curiosity about the nature of our own experiences. Sometimes astrology feels like nothing more than, oh my God, oh my God, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen today? That's the stuff that I really, I, that is the last thing that I'm trying to create with the content that you hear on this channel. So the one thing I don't want is for, for astrology to be seen by people in general as nothing more than, you know, a sh shallow, superficial, you know, anxious thoughts about self-centered thoughts about myself. Oh my God, what's going to happen to me today? What's going to happen to me tomorrow? Like that. So I really try to create content that takes us into a place that's heart-centered, that is about growth, healing, understanding, uh, self-reflection, uh, and, and sort of re-enchanting the cosmos by the way we approach astrology. Number two is astrological stereotypes. I want this channel to be somewhere that you go and you don't have to feel like when it comes time for your sign, all you're hearing are a bunch of stereotypes that really don't, they don't hit the mark. You know, I mean, one of the things I don't like of just, just kind of just pop astrology and believe me when I say, I don't think I'm the only, you know, good astrologer out there. I mean, I, I hope I'm good, but I'm saying that there's a lot of people who have really sensitive, sensible, deep, meaningful astrology. But what I don't like is when you hear the same three things said about Scorpios or Pisces, or you hear everything, everything about Leos is self-centered or, you know, just, just the generic stereotyping of signs, planets, houses, um, that don't really help us go deeper into our experiences. They keep us at a level that, okay, we've got some nice categories to place things into, but how is that helping us appreciate the mystery of the soul? the vastness of the universe, the intelligence of the universe. 
So I, I pour into every episode that I create the intention that you be getting something that deepens and richens your understanding, uh, enriches your understanding of the astrological archetypes, whether they're signs, planets, houses, whatever. Number three is sensationalism. One thing that I also don't really like about astrology is sometimes it's every single video, every single transit is, this is the biggest, most transformational portal, galactic transformational wormhole you're ever going to go down like that. I just, it's just not true. So much of astrology is actually about teaching us how to see the eternal patterns or archetypes in very everyday experiences, which are not that sensational. They're not that out of the ordinary. So much of our life is lived doing repetitive things. It's lived doing routine habits that we have to go to work every day, deal with your kids, take care of your body. I'm not saying that there aren't sensational aspects of experience. There certainly are. And there are sensational transits and there are powerful portals of transformation, but not every freaking transit. You know what I mean? So when you come to my channel, one of the things that you're getting intentionally is deep, enriching astrology that is not about celestial gossip, that's not about sensationalism, and that's not about stereotypes. Now, whether I hit the mark all the time, you know, or occasionally fall into a stereotype, uh, I, I try my best to hit these marks so that um, you know when a transit is big and when it's like, yeah, this is an okay, it's an average transit, and you know how to identify it in small things and big things. You know more about signs than just stereotypes. You know more about astrology and what it can do for your life than just being a bunch of celestial gossip. So anyway, not to, again, my intention here is not to like prop myself up while hitting other people down because I'm not targeting anyone or anything. It's just, these are experiences of astrology that I have had, that I've seen, that I've witnessed. And these are the things that I try to do a little bit differently. These are the things I try to avoid. And, it, and, and it's easy to fall into it, especially when you know you want to get an audience response of likes and thumbs up and stuff like that. Anyway, thank you for listening. If you like this content and you also value the things that we value and pour into it, please consider heading over to the Kickstarter and donating to support us. We still need a bunch of people to pitch in and support this channel before the new year. You can hit the Kickstarter link at the top of the comment section. It's pinned or in the description of the video. Go over there, pick up 50% off any of our online courses, bundle them together and save a bunch more. Uh, come study with us. We'd love to see you in classes. Gift one to someone and take one for yourself in a bundle. There's also a lot of good lectures. My book is available. There's some readings you can pick up when you donate. So uh, we try to say thank you the best we can. And thank you again for everyone who's already donated. And with that, here are your horoscopes for the month of December. Okay. Well, on that note, I'm very happy to bring uh, Alex back as always to join us. Hey, Alex. Hey, Adam. How you doing, <laughs> my dear friend? I'm good, man. I'm, I feel like uh, a new person after eclipse season. Mm, me too. Me too. The Scorpio new moon's rocking me a little bit, but it feels like kind of like a rebalancing of some kind, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was really interesting. My mom was visiting as she's a Scorpio, 12th house Scorpio son. Uh, worked for as a psychiatric nurse practitioner, worked in ER. So she's a very intense person. Um, I would say a very deep person. She was here during the new moon with her partner and then following my dad came and visited. So it was like that saying from Ram Dass, you know, if you think you're enlightened, spend a week with your family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, that was like my Scorpio new moon with all the oppositions to Uranus. It was pretty wild. But I feel like, I feel like, you know, every time I go, I'm in the midst of eclipse season, I always you know, there's part of me that wants to die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. and then you get through it and I'm like, I feel polished and shiny and kind of, I, yeah, I feel, I usually I feel better for having gone through it. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think like, you know, I always like an eclipse season to being thrown into a water slide and you just have to kind of go wherever the water slide takes you and it spits you out the other end. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, but I always forget that once I'm outside of that window, like, I feel like after this one, I feel more grounded and I, I think I feel more mature too, in some mm -hmm. way. I feel like there was something about that, that eclipse season that especially being in Libra, like, you know, sometimes things aren't fair, but that actually can, if you are attentive to the message, it can be in a long-term way, much more settling and much more, um, I don't know. You just feel a deeper sense of like commitment and ease, even if you're going through a sense of like, Oh my God, I'm in all this craziness. Yeah. I feel more grounded in a lot of ways after it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, 
Yeah, exactly. And, and I think um, it's interesting. I, I was really paying a lot of attention to, you know, the, the Mars sun Kazemi. Like that was such a, a powerful transit. And I did some tracking of previous Mars sun Kazemis and the kinds of conflicts that arose that were very empowering but difficult to mm -hmm. move through. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be consistent again this time. Mm -hmm. There were key conflicts, some of them within myself, some of them external. Uh, no one harmed in the making of this astrological movie. <laughs> but it was like there were some hard choices that had to be made. And I and I feel like coming off from that, you know, December's astrology, um, I will say I don't think it's as intense as mm -hmm. November and October. Those mm -hmm. were big months with eclipse season. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but I, I do think we're moving into territory that's there's some charged moments. There's some really interesting themes that we're working with. And um, but I think people will probably find that it's a nice way to cap off the year with a with kind of some rocky spots at the end of the year that we just went through. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that we've been through a really intense, especially with there's all of the Scorpio movements have been so emotionally deep and intense and like, you know, facing all the deep existential realms of Scorpio. And I think, well, yeah, the, some of these transits through Sag can be really interesting at the end of the year uh, in terms of their charge or in terms of some flashpoints. I think there is that generally more jovial and also, you know, we'll probably look at this as we get into the horoscopes, but with Jupiter being in Taurus, there's a little bit more chance to embody during mm -hmm. these transits that moves through Sag and, and, yeah. and the Sag Pisces axis because Jupiter in a nice stable Earth sign has that sense of like, let's take all of that emotional wrangling and put it into the body and right. be able to bring it forward in a more practical way. It, it helps that Jupiter this month is so emphasized and is turning direct. Mm -hmm. At the very end of the month, we get this big shift from Jupiter from the retrograde phase direct. And for Jupiter, actually, let's go ahead and put up the screen and we'll look at So first, what we're going to do today, guys, is we're going to look at the transits that we will be covering in the horoscopes you're about to hear for all 12 signs, and then we'll actually get into it. All right. Well, here are here is the um, the main transit that we're going to be looking at, which is the new moon on December 12th. This is a big one because uh, it includes, and let me get my epic pen, my epic pen. Let's see what Pulling kind of the big arrow. Pulling for today. the big arrow. No whammies, no whammies. You know, I, I, it's, it's crazy that this is okay. Hold on. You know, what's, what's really weird is that yeah. this, I was dealing with this yesterday too, which is that, um, my epic pen just doesn't want to, um, work. So hold on. <laughs> let me just see it. I know it's, I swear to God, you man, asked a little thing, bit too much of epic pen, Adam. I know, I know. It's like, yeah, exactly. Okay, I'm gonna see because it just it was just like I just had it up and it was like, no, I'm not gonna work. So um, let's just see if I can get it to work one more. I'm gonna try one more time. We're gonna see. And all right, now I'm gonna try to highlight it and let's see if it works. Nope. It's you can see the cursor, but it's like it's just not wanting to. Okay, I'm going to try one more thing, and then if not, we're going to give up on trying the Epic Pen this week. Uh, let's try this. And now let's try, nope, still, it's like not having it. <laughs> it's just so weird. I swear to God, the Epic Pen has such a personality, man. <laughs> it's a very Uranian personality. It's like, no, it's not it's working like, for you. Douche. Screw you guys. <laughs> I'm not going to show up just because what? Just because you think I ought to? Well, you know, I'm being taken bound down by this system, man. No way. I know. Right. Um, okay. So, uh, okay. So, anyway, you can see it on the screen. In the ninth house there, you can see the new moon in Sagittarius. And the point is that it is co present with Mars. So, we have a, um, a very powerful new moon in the sign of Jupiter in a month where Jupiter is turning direct uh, by the end of the month. And um, we also have a, a very Marsy new moon. Uh, now, when we kind of take this forward, there are a few. So this is the 12th. There's the new moon in Sagittarius. We take this forward a little bit, and we're going to see that just a few days later, the sun will then square Neptune. Here you can see uh, sun in the ninth, Neptune in the 12th. And I'm sorry that my not going to call it stupid, but my pen <laughs> isn't uncooperative. working. So. <laughs> uncooperative. Uncooperative. <laughs> you can see the uh, sun and Neptune 
across the 9th and 12th there, squaring at 24 degrees. That's on the 16th. So we start to get this repetition around Neptune after the new moon, which is also pretty close to a square with Neptune. Uh, we're going to go forward just a little bit to the 27th. We start spreading this out, and you're going to see that Mercury's retrograde takes it from Capricorn back into Sagittarius. Now, the Mercury retrograde uh, happens around December 13th, just the day after the new moon. So the new moon coincides with the Mercury retrograde that then comes back into Sagittarius. And on the 27th, you get a square to Neptune, followed almost immediately with a conjunction to Mars. If you take Mars forward, then just one day, Mars will then go through the next day on the 28th, will then go through the square to Neptune. You can see it closing in there from the eighth house to the 11th house at around 24 going into the 25th degree. So that's a, that's a powerful sequence from the new moon forward of, you know, three different planets squaring Neptune. The sun, the new moon squares Neptune, then the sun squares Neptune, then Mercury retrograde comes back and squares Neptune, conjoins with Mars, and Mars squares Neptune. It's a very Jupiterian month in the sense that both of these signs, Sagittarius and Pisces, are Jupiter ruled. And remember, by the very end of the month, on the 30th, Jupiter will then turn direct. Just two days later, take it forward. You can see Jupiter there with the S next to it in the first house. That means it's stationing to turn direct. So it's like a, a major Jupiterian turning point with a kind of boiling cauldron of fire and water in the Jupiter signs with uh, a, a big dose of these planets squaring Neptune and um, quite frankly, some really pointed energies. The themes that come to my mind instantly, and then I'd like to hear what you think, Alex, yeah. are the power and passion of our beliefs these are Jupiter ruled signs and uh, you get a lot of Mars, Mercury, you think of words, ideas, beliefs, and what we were, what we are willing to stand up for or fight for. But I also think of almost like delusions and fanaticism mm -hmm. and fantasy, the power of fantasy over the, uh, within the mind, uh, the power of imagination and r religious or political philosophies and what we're willing to fight other people about. The one thing that I think is really nice is that Jupiter in a Venus ruled sign, a solid earth sign turning direct, Jupiter turning direct at the end of the month, to me suggests that extremes might be tempered mm -hmm. or any kind of boundaryless, ungrounded, fanatical, illusory thinking may be checked by the very end of the month. But that looks to me like th these are the major things that I, th I see us working with. Um, in reflecting on those same themes, Alex, you want to add anything? Yeah, you know, I, I, one other point on Jupiter turning direct that I like in Venus's sign is Venus will also have moved by that point and gained dignity from moving from Scorpio into Sagittarius. Um, and I like that as an emphasis of what you just said, Adam, of if things feel with Mercury and Mars together, that can be a very, and I don't necessarily mean this as a, in a political way, but a divisive or an analyzing or a separating type of uh, um, combination of planets. And I feel like if there's anything where it feels like we've gone off into some space where we have separated out too much. The end of the year feels like a very big coalescing point with Jupiter's yes. turnaround and also Venus now moving into Jupiter's sign. And Venus has really, you know, been pulling up a lot of cleanup duty as she's gone through Libra and Scorpio this year. And, um, and I think, so I think that that's one re really interesting positive sign with that too. But yeah, I, I would echo all of that, Adam. And I'd, um, I'd say also, you know, the discernment between when is a good story and a good belief a really nice thing to have? And where is it serving to try to further a point of view that we have by holding to it no matter what? There's a type of even, you know, I've seen so much with Mars and Sagittarius and evangelical type of feeling to it. There's an evangelist feeling to Mars and Sagittarius. And I think that there's, you know, sometimes when we our imagination and our stories and a little bit of heightened reality like i think of movies like you know chocolat or amelie or um 
there's some even the Tim Burton movies maybe are a little darker, but there's a little heightened reality to those movies that makes the story really compelling and interesting and beautiful to watch. But you wouldn't take all those movies as absolute fact. You'd have to separate out, you know, parts in those movies of like, well, yeah, here's the story, but here's like the embellishment of the art department. Here's the embellishment of the imagination. And I think being very discerning about when our imagination is healing this month, when our heightened reality is healing, and then discerning where we might be going off into a place where um, because we have asserted it, thus is it so is taking over right and i think that i'm just speaking as a sagittarius that is a very po powerful sagittarius tendency is i have asserted this as a belief and now i have just deemed it to be so right there, i've heard it described with sagittarius as um molding the world to through the shape of my will mm -hmm. right and, and and of course with sag may go my belief mm -hmm. um but with fire in general, it's there's a lot of like, if I will it to be so if I believe it to be so, if I act upon it, then it is. Mm -hmm. And there's something that dates back. I mean, I just think of like, in, you know, like in the beginning was the word, and you know, like that whole the logos, and there's there's something about fire, even for ancient astrologers that was fire was closest in the elemental sphere to the realm of the gods. And, and so there is something there's something about fire that we we constantly think of maybe fire only in terms of like anger or mm -hmm. willpower or aggression mm -hmm. but fire is also about that flicker of light that captures some kind of image and it's so compelling because of the way it, it arrives in a sort of prophetic like alleluia space mm -hmm. when it shows up and then it's so hard not to follow it and just be on a crusade about it especially when you got mars in a fire sign like sagittarius so I love the way you put that because it's like, um, yeah, like what, this month could, there could be a lot of, you know, stick with your vision, you know, and, and keep to it. And then there's a point, and then there's also maybe a, a sort of a point at which we might be getting checked, you know, just because you believe something doesn't make it true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, interesting. Let's start off with Aries. We'll go every other as we always do. Um, I got a request last time that I thought was interesting. They said, could you guys flip flop so that um, Alex can treat the uh, masculine signs and Adam the feminine and then reverse it? And I thought, you know, that's a good idea because we always start. I always go Aries, you go Taurus, I go, you know, like that. Oh, yeah. And they went, could you flip it? And I was like, yep, we'll do that. So not to put you on the spot because I didn't tell you that in advance, it's okay. <laughs> but I just remembered it. I was like, you know, we should do that. So uh, you want to start us off with Aries and we'll, no worries, we'll, we'll be looking just so people know, because my Epic pen doesn't work <laughs> that we're going to be looking at in particular, the Sagittarius and Pisces axis. And we're looking at these dates again, December 12th for the new moon in Sagittarius. And then we kind of go down the line a little bit, a little bit later in the month that we get this sequence of Mercury squared to Neptune, Mercury conjunct Mars and Mars square to Neptune. We also get the sun square Neptune right after the new moon. So that's, a, it's like the 12th through the rest of the month is what we're looking at across the Sag Pisces axis. So this is really interesting for Aries risings, you know, so you have your ascendant ruler Mars co-present with this new moon uh, in your ninth house um squaring neptune in your 12th and you know this this brings to mind to me you know just what adam and i have been, been talking about this idea of belief and the shift change or willingness to go in new directions around the ways you make sense of the world the way you coalesce reality the way you um the way you formulate your own inner structures and your own inner laws um and i think what's interesting in the square to neptune in the 12th house is that it may be looking at subconscious places or places that are in your blind spot where um, your your ideals have colored your beliefs thus far for good or for bad. Sometimes, you know, our idealistic sense that the Neptune idealistic sense of a sort of perfect and, and um, uh, an unchanging safe place can be a wonderful way where we create a sense of uh, softness and integration around our beliefs, but it can also be a place where we don't realize we're holding our belief set up to an impossible standard, something, an ideal that our mind created as opposed to something that's in reality. So that's something I would really look at for those series of transits. Now, I think that what would be interesting is as Mercury moves back into Sagittarius in its retrograde cycle and conjuncts Mars and Mars then squares Neptune, 
that actually might be a time for extra discernment around those ideas. You know, normally Mercury and Mars together are a pretty uh, um, executive, pretty analytical pair. But in Sagittarius, they can have a sense of like being, oh, look what you did. The Figured master is back. <laughs> <laughs> there could be a sense, I think, with this in Mercury retrograde, particularly in Sagittarius, of um, are my beliefs uh, in line with the analytical facts of the situation and mm -hmm. maybe really taking some time to be like, is this a sort of tale that I am weaving or is this based on some data? That's where I'd start yeah. up with that. Yeah. yeah I mean, just the, the whole question of the, the realm of higher beliefs and ideas that, in, that are uh, like that form your compass in the ninth house. There's a lot of emphasis on those right now. And also maybe some conflict around them for Aries, but then they're being paired with the Neptune in the 12th. The question is, are these beliefs undermining you in some way? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Or are they pointing you toward some kind of excavation of unconscious material? And keep in mind that what you are most passionate about right now, even slightly angry about might be pointing to some unresolved or unconscious material that's that's the that's the add-on that i would give for that one yeah for sure i mean i would a, a phrase that might serve really well this month for aries risings is this idea of like if you notice something like that that happening taking a big breath and saying that's interesting let me check that out that's yeah. interesting let me check that out that's a really good phrase for this month for aries dude I, I can't believe you just said that because just last night i was on a walk with ashley and we were walking and there's you know something that i've been thinking about like how do i handle this particular thing and um and i said you know what i'm gonna do i am going to trust that my higher faculties diamonds angels whatever um have the ability to figure this out and i am going to surrender it and i guarantee you that if i do that within a week i will spontaneously have a moment of insight where i understand what i ought to do and it's just like the and it might also be that as an adult it you know there's just i I'm, it's a little easier for me to go like huh, huh mm -hmm. no. all right I had no idea that was that was something i wasn't expecting and then just let it go for a while it's like trying to remember the lyrics to a song. You let it go, and then all of a sudden your brain comes up with it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's a great way of putting it. All right. Well, moving on to Taurus, we have the new moon in your eighth house with subsequent squares over and over again from Sun, Mercury, Mars uh, to Neptune in the 11th. Now, for me, eighth house, 11th house dynamics are almost always about the compromises that we should or should not be making with respect to allies and the resources that other people are willing to share with us or that come to us through some kinds of, of psychological, emotional, or, or maybe just soul contracts. It's like, what, what do you have to give me? What do I have to give you? How can you help me get where I'm going as an ally, a friend, a colleague, uh, even a lover or a spouse? What resources are available through the people I know, the groups or communities I belong to, the allies and friends that I have, and are they are the right ones? I could see there being some real conflicts of value between yourself and other people. What might make it hard is that you need some of these people. And you may need them for reasons that are, you know, more bottom line than others, financial reasons or emotional reasons or, you know, whatever. It's hard, for example, when you have mentors, teachers, therapists, people that you rely on deeply for support in your life, which is a very eighth house thing. Um, and you, they're a part of a larger community that you're a part of, and you don't want to, you might have a conflict with them, but you realize if I go too far with this, I might disturb the ecosystem of a larger community I belong to. It's tricky situations like that, that tend to come up across the eighth house and 11th house. And I think these transits are probably doing just that this month, but maybe with a little bit extra emphasis on differing values or beliefs. Mm. Those, that's my hot take on that one. Um, but I think the other thing that would come up would just be, you know, something, a, a new moon in the eighth house could just be that there's new resources available to you and questions about how to collaborate and use them wisely with other people, which might actually be really fun. Yeah, I love that, Adam. I love that. You know, it's, 
I keep thinking, you know, in the eighth house with Neptune here and just, you know, speaking through this, but some of you know who listened to me before, my son is exactly conjunct Neptune. So I'm very familiar with sun and Neptune type of dynamics um, is being really mindful of how you're I, I would add to this out and how you're acting within your energetic bonds with people and in your relationships. Are you acting from a clear place within yourself or are you acting out of trying to main, maintain a certain sense of like everything's just fine? Everything's OK. Um, you know, are you taking actions because these are the the actions that are true to your own beliefs, your own guidance, your own heart, or are you taking actions because you might feel guilty or I don't want to make anybody feel bad or I want everybody to feel okay or I feel, you know, this over overreaching sense of what might feel like compassion, but actually might be subjugating your own needs and wants. And I think that there, there's like you're you know, adding to what you were saying, Adam, there's that sense of like needing to not only know your values, but this sense of balance between what I assert and go forward with in terms of my own, uh, the way I'm tied to different types of systems, and then also taking others into consideration and kind of finding the right balance of that. I could see that being pretty strong with Neptune in the air this, right. month, this month. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, let us go move it along to Gemini. Uh, and I'll just highlight it for you here, Alex. Thank you. It's nice to have it back. All right. So <laughs> we have for Gemini Risings, we have the new moon in Sagittarius in your seventh house, uh, which is co-present with Mars, squaring Neptune in your 10th house. This is really interesting because, you know, I could see this as some new bold um, way of being in relationship. Maybe that is the formation of relationship. Maybe it's the way you relate uh just the way you sort of conceptualize relationships going through a very sort of like um, a process where you're comparing it or um, seeing it in relationship to the way you are seen in the world. You know, I think in that 10th house, I'm not seeing that so much as career right now. I'm sure that will come up. It could come up around your career, but I could see something here like around like uh, I'm starting a more, intense, beautiful, bold vision of relationship. But is there something that's going on in the way I'm seen in the world, which could have to do with career that is feels like it's not quite allowing me to see my new bold vision of relationship clearly. And somehow how like career and relationship are not quite uh, clear with each other. That I think is this is one where I would really look towards the end of the month that is Jupiter goes direct in the 12th house there is a sense of something that was maybe under the surface that was not allowing this to be clear, somehow turning around or somehow being illuminated that allows for a greater sense of this more bold vision that gets created uh, around this new moon to really be implemented. I like um, the idea that, uh, like, I could see this as, someone like how much persuasive power does someone in your life maybe it's a significant other or it's like one maybe one particular person that you have a closer relationship with but it, it feels like i could see this as someone who is very persuasive mm -hmm. and whose beliefs and whose view of how things ought to go um whatever they are pursuing or most passionate about could be a source of conflict for you. Mm. For example, imagine that your spouse suddenly gets really passionate about a money making scheme, you know, and you have to, you have to be like, um, what are you getting wrapped up in right now? Um, this could also be about the power that someone else has to gaslight you or to um, make you feel like their values, beliefs, or motivations ought to be your own. I could see something like that coming in because the the kind of persuasive power of Sagittarius in the seventh, you know, with Neptune in the tenth, might be very seductive. Well, this is what you ought to do for a living. This is what you ought to do with your life. This is what you ought to pursue. This is what worthwhile goals are, or this is what a worthwhile life looks like. So, one thing I would add in would just be someone trying to sell you something and asking if it's your truth or not at, mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. Does it reflect your ideals? Is it, you know, maybe even with the sun and Neptune too, is another really good way of thinking of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. 
Um, okay, let's go to Cancer. With Cancer, we have the new moon. Whoops, let me just kind of draw this over this way. Let's go like this. New moon in Sag squaring Neptune with the sun square Neptune, Mercury coming back into Sag, conjoining Mars, both squaring Neptune. The sixth to the ninth to me feels like um, matters of, of passion. Uh, what are we working on behalf of? What ideals or missions or beliefs are we sacrificing on behalf of? I could see this, for example, as a period of time in, you know, during which a person decides to um, do some kind of boot camp, you know, like let's go to the, let's go to the boot camp at the gym and I'm going to just get totally wrapped up in something that requires a lot of work and effort, but is very, it's motivating me. You know, the, the great thing about the sixth house, if you think about it as the joy of Mars, which is one of the ways it was, it was described by ancient astrologers is that it is a house that rewards us when we cut a little of ourselves off and throw it into the fire. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, that act of sacrifice, which is why people often think of the sixth house as a place of service. It's not service as much as it is sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And often service is sacrificial. Mm -hmm. You think about it that way. What are we in sacrificial service to? What are we what kinds of higher beliefs are motivating us to fight or burn or or work you have to sacrifice if you want to get a higher degree you have to sacrifice if you want the benefits of a religious or spiritual practice like you have to sit down and meditate every day or you got to do your yoga if you want to you know um change your physique you have to sweat in the gym all that kind of stuff um also what isn't worth it what are we mm -hmm. burning ourselves up for that we are coming to see is maybe not as, as substantive or even is, you know, maybe it's an illusion. Those are the things that come to mind for me here. Although there is maybe, I think, yeah, also just like maybe a, a broader question about like what motivates me and what's a good motivation for, for hard work or doing hard things. You know, it reminds me of there's a uh, there's a story of one of the Tibetan Buddhist teachers saying he would always put his tea slightly out of reach to remind himself that spiritual practice is inconvenient. You have mm -hmm. to reach for something. You have to get up. You have to move over to get it. And I think that I've had a slew of sixth house transits over the last, you know, well, Pluto's been in there for a while, but I've had, you know, a lot of other planets march through there too over the last three or four years. And that is, if I put a big umbrella word around it, it feels slightly inconvenient towards a greater goal, reminding yourself about a greater goal, something, something that you want. And it's like, okay, well, you're going to put the, we're going to put the tea slightly out of reach and you're going to have to inconvenience yourself up a little bit to get up and walk around the table right. to go get it. But it's worth it when you did, because you recognize the effort and the will and the strength that you put into that to receive whatever that is. And I would say on that, just on that note too, that you know, you would be mindful here too of, I think you mentioned this a little bit, Adam, over-sacrificing yourself yes, uh, with right. Neptune involved and, and the sixth house involved, you know, saying like, oh, it's okay, don't worry, don't worry about me. If that's a tendency for you, if you tend to, you know, people please or, or placate, and you know that that's something that's coming up for you, I think this could, with the co-presence of Mars in its joy in the sixth house, be a nice place to look at some of those beliefs of where am I overly sacrificing myself mm, yeah. in service of something else, yeah. Right. Um, almost like wh where do I need some better boundaries around my, yeah. uh, my, my work drive or my sacrifice drive or something, yeah. a yeah. sacrifice sure. drive. That sounds like a, like a computer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 250 megabyte sacrifice. Drive. <laughs> <laughs> it's the <All> last right. <laughs> here is Leo rising, uh, with the new moon in Sagittarius in the fifth and subsequent squares from the sun, from Mercury, from Mars uh, to Neptune in the eighth. All right, so for all of us Leo Risings, because I must refer to us as a collective, um, I am interested in this one, this whole series of transits, because I could see this being an extremely visionary transit. I could see it being something where, um, through a lot of creative vision, a lot of creative uh, output, the the ability maybe again to have a little bit of fun. There's some way that we sort of um, harmonize or um, 
wash away discords that have been held for a long time in our sort of energetic karma. And thinking about Neptune in the eighth house here, there's a way that we can sort of come out of a place of being with these very serious Scorpio trans transits we've been going through, coming into a lighter feeling in a Jupiter sign of Sagittarius in the fifth house where are the way we vision the world, maybe with more fun and joy and creativity, helps us find a sense of finally putting to rest, washing away, bringing back into a sense of um, evenness, really old, uh, intensely entangled energetic ties. It's one way I could see that. I'm kind of feeling that in my own life right now. So it's kind of extrapolating from that too. Yeah. Um I think, you know, you, again, one of the things that I always go to is the simplest definitions of houses. And one of those for the fifth house was a place of um, pleasure. Mm. And, and, and by that, like, it's called the house of Venus. And um, I look at this right now and I think to myself, like, okay, first of all, with the centaur in the fifth and Mars there, it's like, um, could this be a, a, a party animal transit? Mm -hmm. You know, could, could this be something where people are pressing the gas pedal too hard? And one of the things that the eighth house was described at was, was the house of penalties. Mm. Like, is there a penalty for partying too hard right now for seeking pleasure with, uh, too much ferocity? You know, it's like, a uh, ferocious pleasure drives might be penalized. Um, you may also see that some something you're very passionate about creatively um, or something that's supposed to be fun is becoming more competitive than it ought to and that there's um you know for example i could see the sagittarius new moon with mars bulldozing someone else in the name of fun or creativity and someone else is the you know the sort of victim uh of of neptune in the eighth you know and someone else feels used right yeah. like the eighth house is other people's resources someone else feels used because the the leo with the the sag energy in the fifth is sort of like well everyone's having fun right <laughs> it's not just me you know but it's like no there's you know someone else might have might have different needs um, that comes to mind. And then the other thing that I guess comes up would be that um, when we want to have fun and we're really excited and feeling very passionate about something, but someone else feels threatened by that because they think that that's taking us on a train away from them. And so they'll try to pull us back in with needs that covertly undermine our passion or pleasure or happiness or creativity. So mm -hmm. it's like sucking you back in, trying to keep you tangled up in there in a, like a codependent situation. Yeah. Those yeah. are things that come to my mind as well. The moral of the story for us as Leo Risings is don't get on your friend's table at a house party and start <laughs> dancing. And when the table breaks and everybody has it on video, you say, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this so, is your grandmother's <laughs> antique table from the 18 ounce. Oh, whatever. <laughs> I'm just happy. So happy that someone as cool as me broke it. <laughs> I know. know, right? And it's all on video. It's going to go viral. <laughs> You're going to get rich off of this. <laughs> All right, let me put the Virgo rising on the ascendant. And we are now looking at the new moon in Sagittarius in the fourth square to the Neptune in uh, the seventh. Of course, the sun will square Neptune. I should redraw this so it doesn't go to Saturn. Uh, let's go to... So sun will square Neptune. Mercury will square Neptune. Mercury will conjoin Mars. Mars will square Neptune across the fourth and seventh. I think here about the intersection between uh, family and relationships. Uh, it, when these two houses meet in transits, it is quite common for people to be dealing with issues in their relationships that stem from their families of origin. 
you know, this is what my background is. This is what your background is. And isn't it interesting that the conflicts and differences that we're having stem back to our childhood trauma or the way we were raised or, you know, something like that. I would not be surprised if there were conflict over uh, conflict around moving or living environments within relationships for Virgos. Um, if there was some uh, level of conflict between the, um, you know, the, the, the one, one partner having one vision of what family or home should look like. So that could include where you live, if you have kids or not, um, does your family go to church or not, or have some religious involvement or not. Um, it could also be about political or ideological or religious differences in relationships that again may reflect the different ways in which people were raised or where people come from. Those are the main things that come to my mind with these uh, transits, but also um, there's something new growing. And the, the, the square to Neptune in the seventh does strike me as the potential for maybe some healing around, um, especially like anger and uh, like fanatical or intense beliefs that are in our, our history, our family history. Like maybe there's some healing around dogmatic uh, things we were raised with ideas that are, we have unconsciously embraced, even though we don't even like them. Mm -hmm. That happens a lot, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I could see this if I'm, as I'm looking at the, all these arrows and Sag pointing up towards Neptune here, and I'm thinking of in the, from the fourth house, it would be interesting to see if along the lines of what Adam was saying, there's this idea of like a very persuasive, very strong, powerful family dynamic or family belief system that may feel like, in a primary relationship, whether you're in a primary relationship, getting into one, or maybe you're, you know, you're just the way you think about primary relationship. There's a way that you might sacrifice or not stand up for what you want within the individual individuality of that particular relationship that we have our family of origin, which is so much informing of who we are. But then as we move into primary partnerships, there's also that separate family unit that has its own structures and beliefs and ways of doing things. And I could see there being some, maybe some new beginnings around feeling like instead of uh, needing to debase or sacrifice the needs of the individuated family, there's a sense of like, well, yeah, you know, you want us to come here for this holiday. That's cool. Well, we're going to do this on this holiday because that's our family thing. Something like that. I could see those types of conversations coming up right in time for the holidays too, folks. Right, <laughs> right. in time for the holidays. Yeah. These, but um, yeah, that's where I go with that. Right on. Yeah. Uh, let's go into Libra and we have the new moon, uh, in the third house for Libra's squaring Neptune in the sixth. I feel like every month I've been saying, I love this few Libras, but I do. I really <laughs> like this Libras because, you know, um, I think a new moon in Sag, a big, bold new moon and Jupiter sign co-present with Mars in your third house, squaring Neptune in your sixth. You know, again, Libras can be a sign where um, there's always a focus on the many. There's always a focus on the communal. There's always a focus on what everybody else is needing and wanting and really trying to tap dance and adapt to what those are. And I'm wondering if, you know, in the sphere of your mind this month, in your environment, in the way that you, the things that are around you every day, there's some big, bold changes that you make that let you know you don't have to be sacrificial in a way that um, negates your own sense of self and your own bold vision for what you want to do. And I think that that's a, I think this is a really interesting and wonderful transit for you guys in this regard, because, uh, you know, Neptune in the sixth might highlight in a square to all these planets in Sag places where you've believed you need to, put everybody's needs before your own. You need to debase yourself, pull yourself down so others can feel better about themselves. And there's an assertion that comes from this new moon that I really like for Libras a lot. Hmm. A certain yeah. quality. Yeah. So I'm being a little sneaky here because I'm looking and I'm noticing that, you know, obviously Mercury's retrograde is going to start off in the fourth. Hmm. Um, it then retrogrades back into third, into the third. And it makes me think, Oh, 
what's happening in your local environment, including your own home, that is acting as an irritant Mm -hmm. and maybe draining you or asking you to sacrifice, but it's more of an, it's more of an irritating thing. Um, For example, um, I happen to know someone who um, was, uh, oops, here, let me, something popped up there. I happen to know someone who tried to do the nice thing of letting a neighbor whose lease was up and was moving to a different apartment in the same building, but they had like a three or that like had like a four day lapse or something between they had no place to go. And so they were like, well, you could just stay in my apartment for a couple of days. Well, then it turned into like four weeks before they could actually get into this other apartment. And it, it, progressively they kept, they kept asking for and demanding for more and more things Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. just you know it it was like oh god you know no good deed goes unpunished kind of thing you know (laughs) like and um i could see this as something coming into your environment that is irritating and difficult to deal with that provokes anger or frustration and that um that, that someone or something is sort of demanding that you adapt or change again, really kind of against your will and make some kind of sacrifice that um, is, is due to someone or something else needing something. Mm. And, and the reason I think of that is because Mercury retrograde starting in the fourth, the place of your living environment, bumping into the third, the place of your local environment while Mars is there hitting Mars and then squaring Neptune in the sixth, the place of sacrifice where it's like, okay, what's changing in your local environment that all of a sudden is demanding something of you? And do you want to make that sacrifice? Do you have to? Um, How angry is it making you? How irritated? How drained? How frustrated? And maybe a little bit of perseverance needed? And I think that would test the very Libran qualities of um, diplomacy and care and concern for others and having a hard time putting oneself first as a Libra that Mm -hmm. you, you were talking about. I think that's why I really love having Mars here with that, like you were noting, Adam, is because it it Mars sort of and Mars in a lot of ways this year, especially at the end of the year, has been doing this for Libras, even in, in its transit through Libra, is the assertion of my own self and my own needs, and that that is not a bad or wrong thing. It can get out of balance for sure. You know, Aries can go to the other side of that on the opposite side of the axis, but I love that. It's a really I like the boldness of this new moon for Libras. It may test your comfort level this month with what you're willing to do. But I think there's a level of um, power and centeredness you feel when you stand up for and assert what you need in a really healthy and wonderful way. It really helps a lot. For sure. Yeah. Moving into Scorpio rising, got the new moon in Sag squaring Neptune with the sun square Neptune and then Mercury and Mars both squaring Neptune as they can join after Mercury's retrograde. This is across the second and fifth house axis for Scorpios. Well, um, one thing that I'll add as just a, a side note is that for Scorpios and Tauruses, you actually, although we've had so much ax, uh, action across the Scorpio Taurus um, axis, Venus in your first house opposing Jupiter and Uranus this month are also kind of a big storyline. So I just want to mention on the, for, for specifically for Tauruses and Scorpios, we could have also chosen to talk about that. And we're, we're, we didn't, we kind of went in a different direction today, but just so you know, the, the access of self and other and relationships um, are quite, uh, quite powerful this month for the, for the Scorpios. But I wonder if alongside of that, with the the some of these very strong transits, including the new moon in the second and the connection to the fifth, aren't raising questions about quality of life. Yeah. Um, now, maybe that has some tie into relationships and different philosophies about what uh, lifestyle is going to provide the most happiness, comfort, and security. But I get the feeling that conflicts around money and questions of the creative use of money or the what is the relationship to money or finances or resources that uh, is is most conducive to happiness you know it's like well what what kind of lifestyle do i want to have what do i want to be able to do with my time my money my energy and my resources what will provide the most happiness how can i make changes in these ways now there could be 
maybe even some entrepreneurial um, qualities to Mars in the second right now, along with a new moon that's launching a new creative idea that maybe you, a new business or, uh, but I think in a broader sense, the question is how can I change either how I'm earning or what I'm earning or how I'm using what I have for the sake of greater happiness and creative fulfillment. Um, and that's the second fifth house access quite frequently. Sometimes there's also questions about what kinds of changes do I have to make because of, you know, having children or getting pregnant or something like that. Like fifth house could kind of tap into the topic of children or pregnancy and the question of finances at the same time. But I think the, the big thing is going to be about the direction you're going in with the resources you have or what you want them to look like compared to where they are right now, especially for the sake of creative fulfillment and pleasure. Yeah, I love that. I love that. You know, it makes me think of, you know, when I was 26, I left my corporate job to teach yoga full time. And um, that was something that was pretty fairly easy for me to do at 26 because I had no major responsibilities, no kids, no nothing. I could just jump out and say, hey, this sounds like a great idea. And it was really hard for a few years. I had I didn't realize it was a very Neptunian moment of realizing like, hey, this bold vision I have of being a yoga teacher and doing all this stuff is going to take a lot more work than I had thought it thought at first. And it makes me wonder too, Adam, with this, you know, a bold Sagittarius new moon um, of the centaur and Neptune in the fifth house about like, you know, the vision you may have of how you can make money or where money will come in from your creative pursuits. And then really carefully balancing that against what are the sort, you know, this is ruled by Jupiter and Taurus, a very practical earth stable sign of like the, the practical human needs balancing that vision against like, well, what's the pragmatism of this? Because I can assure you when I made that decision, it was not a practical decision. I'm like, I don't want to do my corporate job. I'll teach yoga. And, and then I had to really like dig out of that after a, for a couple of years. And so I think it's a really interesting way of looking at this transit of like, look at the wonderful creative visions you have, how you can earn income, how you might change the way you earn income, but just being mindful that there's also that, mindful pause and sense of grounded discernment that comes in with it too. Yeah. 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 It, it, the, again, just emphasizing one other interesting piece might be the overlap between these questions about money, resources, et cetera, and relationships. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Let's go to Sag rising where we have the new moon in Sag with the subsequent squares from the sun, Mercury and Mars to Neptune in Pisces from the first to the fourth house. Well, Sages are going on their Madonna reinvention tour this month. This is all about. <laughs> and you're of Adam and my generation. If you got that reference, you... <laughs> yeah. you'll know what that is. But yeah, this is, I'd say, a real invention and in identity and sense of self, you know, that um, might feel a little, you know, and I know as Sagittarius is as a Sagittarius. So like, what? Here I am. It's a brand new me. It's a brand new this. And I'm doing that. And, you know, and. You're all going to love it. And being mindful about, you know, as this is balanced against the fourth house with Neptune there, like, are there aspects that are coming from either family of origin or coming from your ancestry or um, coming from the place of your family that in that really big assertion might inadvertently sort of trample over some of the more delicate spaces for family of origin or places we come from our ancestry. You know, I think about some of the big changes that mm. I've sometimes made in my life. And when I didn't do it skillfully, sometimes it really hurt my family in a way I didn't intend it to. Um, but there were certain things that came from their belief system or the way they, they perceive things that I perceived as a constriction that was actually them trying to show a sense of tradition in a lot of ways. And so as I've gotten older, I've learned how to balance that out and be sensitive to it. But I think it's just that's again, it's a balance this month between the idea of really boldly going forward and then also being mindful of the more sensitive, um, maybe less uh, less center stage aspects of the emotional world that for this month's for Sages would probably be coming from fourth house things. I'm thinking more ancestry, but, you know, family of origin and that sort of idea, too. Yeah. I mean, I would say the desire for personal freedom and self-expression and a focus on me as a Sag is really strong. So is are those motivations coming from, uh, you know, places that, um, you know, 
like maybe some of those choices are overcompensations uh, resulting from traumas in our past. You know, yeah. like like how is this kind of flowering, flashy, fiery moment of selfhood related to our history around, like you said, ancestry and family? And being aware of that is probably good right now. Um, yeah. On the other hand, I also think the fourth house in Indian astrology is just called moksha, which means liberation, Neptune in the fourth, squaring these planets. I could see people going to real extremes around around the need for freedom, drinking, mm -hmm. drugs, you know, excessiveness because of the desire to be freer. Um, I would watch for that right now. And I would also be concerned about what kinds of habits um, we're saying yes to uh that that might feel free but are maybe subtly imprisoning us uh over time we've also got saturn in that house and neptune that the, the conviction that we feel around what we're doing in the sake for the sake of freedom or personal liberation um might come at a cost later if we're not aware of subtler things that are going on yeah, that's kind of the old adage that like the thing that I think is going to free me is actually the thing that ties me deeper. That's one, you know, yeah. many traditions is like that. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, Capricorn rising, we've got the new moon in the 12th and we have a square to Neptune, subsequent squares from the sun, Mercury and Mars across the 12th and third. I think about this for caps really um, in a straightforward way as unconscious material that is bubbling up through and in your environment. Um, this is to me like a very psychosomatic um, set series of transits where you're going to see things manifesting around you in people, things, and even, you know, pets or just anything in the environment becoming a vehicle for you to see or understand something about your own unconscious material. And I would think synchronicities could be pretty loud in the environment as a way of drawing your attention to things that are, you know, kind of um, boiling in an, in, a, in an less accessible space. The 12th house being a place we can't see, the third house and Neptune being a very subtle realm, but one that's very impressionable and in the environment around us, like the water, the fish are swimming in. So I, I, I look for, per, you know, Mercury's retrograde in your first house, some really deep ability to understand ourselves, uh, through those unconscious things that are making themselves seen in the world around us. You know, when I'm working with clients, more when I'm doing energy work with clients or coaching with clients, and they ask me like, well, how do I know it's a sign? I say, well, first of all, it's personal. But so it does, it, a sign means something different for all of us. But also it stands out in some way. It's odd. It, there's something about it that just you get a gut sense this is trying to get my attention. I've had that happen with people who are working with animal signs all the time. There's just something odd about it that keeps calling your attention to it. But is it personally relatively significant? And I think that it's helpful that this 12th house transit is in Sagittarius because that, that those are not subtle placements, Mars and the sun in Sagittarius. Um, and there's a sense that you could glean a lot of information um, about how your unconscious and your environment are interrelated by looking for the things that suddenly stand out, suddenly get your attention, suddenly shift the way you see or believe about the world in those ways. Yep. 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 With Aquarius, we are looking at, and I'm going to see if I can't back this up by just a, a day now at this point. There we go. So with Aquarius rising, we're looking at the new moon in the 11th and all of those planetary transits, including the sun, Mercury and Mars, all squaring Neptune and Pisces in the second. So this is interesting for Aquarians. You know, I think that I usually see 11th and second house transits as stuff to do with groups and networks and money and how or the resources that are being exchanged within them. Are there fair exchanges of resources? Are there, you know, how how is the energy being transmuted or transmitted through those those networks? Um, this could feel like a really big um, new beginning in the sense of how you decide to stand out and stand up within stand out in and stand up within uh the groups that you're in the way you sort of lead the way you move forward the way you uh persuade i could definitely see that and that's somehow relating to maybe 
taking some power back around your money, like maybe asserting like, you know, I'm going to go forward in this certain way that might even be a little bit different or uh, off from where other people in my groups and my, my sort of social networks would go. But it's in the name of sort of fostering and building up my own sense of self-worth, self-value. And usually when those things rise, then money changes too. But I could see there being a really interesting interplay this month between not feeling like you have to uh, let go of or not uh, take into account your own sense of self-value and self-worth within a greater context of a community or groups. And I think because Aquarians tend to be so communal minded anyways, there is a real sense this month of it's OK sometimes to really assert your own leadership or your own style in service of bolstering your own sense of resources, which can also benefit everybody once that is in place. Hmm. Yeah, um, I I also think about like the possibility exists with these com this combination of being taken advantage of by other people, mm -hmm. other people draining your resources on any level. Um, you know, time, energy, money, et cetera, emotions. Um, so uh, people trying to convince you of things, um, people that might be offering, promising more than they, you know, over promising. Um, so I would be kind of like a buyer beware around very charismatic people that are, you know, need something from you and offer something in return and just stuff like that. I'd also think about, um, visions of collaboration, co collaboration and shared resources with others as just a general theme. Um, so those are some things that come to my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, let's move into last but not least, Pisces. Pisces rising gets the new moon in Sag in the 10th with the subsequent squares from Sun, Mercury and Mars to Neptune in Pisces in the first. Now I would, I would Think about this because the, the drive of the 10th house is toward worldly mastery. Whether you want to become a good astrologer, you want to earn a good living or, you know, get a raise or be taken seriously as someone who has skills and abilities. The 10th house is that, that thing we build of ourselves that makes us something of a citizen and something of a professional and, you know, a reputation that we cultivate. And there's a lot of like pretty passionate activity right there for Pisceans right now. However, does it level with or does it square, you know, your sense of who you are? Um, are you reaching too far, reaching too fast, going too hard for things, accomplishments, fame, success, mastery, rank, achievement, validation, and at the cost of losing yourself, mm -hmm. losing yourself in the process. So I think just questions of identity progress, purpose, and achievement, or professionalism and identity. And there's a real conversation going on between, you know, your first house and your tenth. So who am I? And what am I trying to achieve or accomplish? And um, am I deluding myself? Or am I being clear? Or am I pursuing a, a vision? And even if there's some uncertainty around what will come of it, those are all things I could see constellating for Pisces rising. Yeah, I love that. You know, I, I could see something of I think Pisces often take a lot of crap about being sensitive and very sensitive and they're so sensitive and Neptune there obviously has augmented that, you know, since 2012, but there's, I would also see this as like, you know, sensitivity as a superpower type of thing is like when you look at like, you know, I'm a sensitive in my in and identity, that's as a Pisces rising. There's some amount of sensitivity it depends on where Jupiter is in your chart and other factors, but there's some amount of really sensing the world, really have a deep level of compassion and, you know, uh, uh, the desire to heal and take care of and those sorts of ideas. And those can get out of balance for sure. But I could see, you know, from Pisces to Sag this month, from the first to the 10th, their sense of like recognition around this new moon, like that can be a real superpower. And it yeah. can carry a lot of power too. I think sensitivity is often seen, especially in our culture, as a kind of weakness. But it carries an enormous amount of power when it's wielded effectively and skillfully. Right. This is also maybe with Saturn in the first house, there's questions of like, where do I belong? What, how can I strengthen myself? But also, you know, questions of um, belonging, fitting in or not. Um, just a little extra with Saturn there. But anyway, that rounds it out. We got through all 12. Um, a big thanks to Alex again. Thank you for being here and doing this every month. It's really fun. And it's so fun to see as 
we go on doing this that everyone else really looks forward to it. And, uh, you know, around Nightlight, you're uh, a celebrity. Oh, well, thank you. That's the right thing to say to a Leo Rising. <laughs> if oh, you no, learn... no. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to learn more about Alex and his work, please do check out his website, which is alexamorosi.com. You can book readings with him there. You can see all that he has to offer as both an astrologer and uh, energy healer and um, a coach. You can also find him on Instagram at Alex Amorosi Healing, where Alex also releases regular creative content um, regarding astrology and the transits. Um, I highly recommend checking him out there as well. We are always so happy to have you here and contributing your um, thoughts and wisdom and expertise. It's really fun to do this with someone else because as I've told you a million times, doing horoscopes to me is sort of like gutting fish in a fish market. If I do them for too long and by myself, I start to feel stinky inside. And so like, it just like really helps to have someone else here because then I can bounce ideas off from you and you off from me. And I just think we create much more well-rounded content with the horoscopes when we work on them together. So it is just such a joy to do it every month, man. Oh, I appreciate that. You know, I think it's something it's it's true. I've seen that in many things that I've done over the years, including astrology and yoga teaching is you can get into your silo really easily. And this always helps. So I think like when you are able to like bounce ideas off and they're like, oh, yeah, that's right. I wouldn't have thought that. Let me actually that actually reminds me of something here. Yep. It creates a lot, a lot of uh, synergistic energy, which I really. Yeah. Love. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, don't forget to hop on over to the Kickstarter before we end today. Uh, you can find the link to the Kickstarter, by the way, in the comment section of this video or in the description. Help us reach our goal of 1,777 backers by New Year's. We are well on our way. And thank you to everyone who's already pitched in. Remember, when you pitch in, you can pick out bundles to our online pro bundles for our online online programs. My book, Alex and I breaking down your rising sign horoscope for the year ahead in depth. All of the major transits for 2024. We do horoscopes for uh, your signs. So check those out. Pitch in. Help us reach our goal. We so appreciate you. And uh, thank you guys. We'll see you again next time. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.